anyway, um, it's great to have you here in the house of the Lord this morning. It is great to have you. If you want to take out your, your blue sheets, uh, which are the announcements, I'm sure by now you all know the routine where they're at. But if you want to grab your blue sheets, on one of your sides is all the announcements my wife just read. And on the other side is what we are going to talk about today. Now, today we're going back into our series. But again, don't think of it as just one continuous series. Think of it as just individual messages. Um, each one a sermon on its own. It doesn't even need to be connected to a series, but it is because they're all talking about the attributes of God. And so today we're going to continue in our message called, and he shall be called the king of kings. I love doing this one. I really do because this really shows who our God is. He is alpha. He is omega. He is the healer. He is the provider. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one, but he literally is the king, not just the king of our life, but the king of all kings, the ultimate, the, the, the big honcho, whatever you want to call him. There is no one higher. There is no one greater. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And so I want to kind of get right into it today by reading Psalm 145. We're going to read the whole thing today. And so if you want to turn into your Bibles, uh, into Psalm 145, what, are, what we're going to do, and if you could stand in the honor of God's word, uh, we're going to look at this whole, this whole chapter, and we're going to break it down verse by verse, and we're going to talk about how God is king in everything. I think David gives it, and David, being a king himself, talks about not his kingship, but the kingship that he observes above him, which is God. And all the wrong things that David did, all the, all, the, uh, all the hurts that David had, but he still expresses how much his king is. And I think Psalm 145 really takes the cake on that one. So if you want to turn to Psalm 145, that would be, uh, that would be great. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn there as well. I usually always have it already marked before I did, but I didn't, but that's okay. Um, I think I know where it is, Psalm 145. All right, so turn in your Bibles. You can look up on the screen. There's Bibles in front of you or turn into your, in your phones uh, with that as well. Let's do this. We haven't done this in a while. Lift up your Bibles. Our Bibles are full of what? Good stuff. Amen. Our Bible's full of awesome, wonderful, great stuff from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is a love letter to the Lord today, and let us read this together. Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the king. Everyone say king. I will exalt you, my God, the king. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. No greater, no greatness, no one can fathom. His greatness, no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of your power, of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundance, your abundant goodness, and joyful sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, praise God, and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise your name. Your faithful pray, people extol you. They tell you of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. So that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all who look to you and to give you their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Praise God. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. That may encourage you today. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and he saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked will be destroyed, will, will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of, my, of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever 
and ever. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, right now, Lord, I pray that you open your word to us, and I pray that we're open to your word, that, Lord, we know you and we love you just like David did, and we observe you, Lord, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords who you are. And so we thank you for who you are in our lives and what you're going to do in your most precious and glorious name. All of God's people say, Amen, amen, amen. You may take a seat. So we're going to take that, Psalm 145, and we're going to break that down into some awesome nuggets of inspiration and of divine revelation that God wants to speak into our hearts today. And so what we see here, it's a, David wrote this beautiful psalm. This was David, and he wrote this beautiful psalm which is great. A lot of his psalms are things that are going, that are really hard in his life, but he continues to give praise. And this one's just a praise. This one's just, I'm giving you the glory of everything I'm going through for who you are, for you are my king. David praises God and acknowledges his role in his life. He is king. The psalm expresses several, actually, this psalm that we just read expresses several different ways that God's role as king in his life, but also in ours. So we're going to look at several ways how David acknowledges his Lord as king. And so the first one's on the screen. David acknowledges God's place as king of kings. He expresses that uh, of God's place in this kingship. And let's look at that. In Psalm, so that would be 1 and 2 in Psalm 145. I will exalt you, God, my God, the king. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and I will extol your name forever and ever. David is king. We know that. We've all read the Old Testament. David is king at this time. But he exalts the Lord as, but in, in this psalm, he exalts the Lord as his king. So the king is calling another one king. And he is right. Because God is the king of kings. He is the king of all leadership. He is the king of all presidents. He is the king of all of us. No one is above David, and he acknowledged that. David didn't say, I'm it, I'm the cat, I'm the cat's meow, I am the big honcho here. No, he acknowledged that, yes, I am the king, but a temporary king for such a time as this, who I give my humble Worship to the King of Kings. He acknowledges his place in the King of Kings. He knows where his place is. This is God's rightful place in our lives, and it places us in the rightful place, recognizing him as the Lord and King of all of our lives. When Jesus is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, what does that mean? I mean, we hear it all the time. I just explained it. But what does it mean? It means that, in the end, all other rulers will be conquered or abolished, and he alone will reign supreme as king and lord of all the earth. David, again, was king. But as it says here, he was, he, eventually he died. Every king might have their little vapor of time that they eventually be conquered or will die of a natural death. But our king doesn't have that. He will always be there, and he always will be king. There is no power, there is no king, and no Lord who can oppose him and win. And not even just king, but I'm just saying in more general terms, all of our leaders. There's no prime minister, there's no, there's no president that can oppose him and win. Basically, the idea of Jesus being king of kings and lord of lords means there is no one higher. There is no one higher on that food chain. He is it. The literal buck stops with him. And we praise God for that. His reign over all things is absolute and unbreakable. That's why it's great going to the king of kings, because you know when you come to him, he's it. You know, so many times we don't get the answers we want. We'll go to someone higher. Can I speak to your manager? Then can I speak to your manager? Can I speak to the owner? Well, you want to speak to the big owner, you speak, just go to God. And that's what's awesome. When he died, when Jesus died, he torn that curtain so that we don't have to go, you know, we don't have to just slaughter animals and kind of go to the middleman. But we can go right to, the, right to the king, Jesus Christ. Not only do we have, now, to tell you the truth, not only do we have to go to the king of kings, not only do we get that privilege, but the king of kings is in, the, in our heart. 
That's what's so amazing is that we don't have to travel uh, to sacrifice an animal or travel to, to, uh, you know, to burn incense or whatever. We just, but the king of kings is in our heart. We don't have to travel for him. He's here. And I, and I, I want you to acknowledge that and, and, and to take that in. He is worthy to be praised every day, forever and ever. Amen? Amen. David says every day, and I love this part. He literally said this in the Psalms. Every day I will praise God. Every day. He wasn't like, well, when I feel like it. Because I'm sure there were days where David just didn't feel like it. I'm sure there were days he didn't even want to be king. He was just, he was just tired. But he said every day I will praise you. He didn't, again, it wasn't when I mean it, or maybe I'll do two out of the seven days, or as long as I do four out of seven, that means at least I did more than a not, or it doesn't even make it feel like I did it as a, as a chore. No, but every day I will praise you. Shows that David spent time with the Lord every day. And may that encourage you as well to every day spend time with God. Every day get into his word. Every day, pray to God. Every day, praise and exalt the name of your God, Jesus Christ. And this is the only activity. This is what I love here. This is the only activity that we are doing now that you will be doing for trillions of years. When you think of it, you work, you, you do sports, you do extracurricular activities. You do, your schedule is full of a lot of things. But 99% of what keeps you busy, you will not be doing for eternity. The only thing that you can start now that will never end, the only thing that you can start now that you literally can be doing, when you think about it, if you don't do this every day, if you started today saying, you know what, I'm going to praise God every day, you will literally be starting something today that you will do for trillions and billions and quadrillion years is singing the praises of God. Because when you praise God today, if you start today and tonight, or let's say in a couple of days you, you would pass on, you would wake up and you'd be doing the same thing. Because to be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord. So if you know Jesus and you're praising him today, you will continue to do it every single day forever and ever and ever. And so I, it's a practice that I would start now because it's a practice that you will be doing forever and ever. Not saying anything bad of the things that we do here uh, today on earth, but the thing is, is that if, if we're doing something, if we are doing something now forever and ever, I would assume that's important. And so I would do it now to start, because it isn't going to be just by magic that you die. It's not going to be like, you know what, I'm just so busy now that I'll just wait till I die. No, no, we, we need to start it now. You need to start the practice of presence. Practice of presence. Practice of the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Getting into his presence, getting into his glory. Because if we don't start now, why will you want to even start later? You want to start now and continue it until you see him in glory. Because one day you're going to, one day you're going to pass from praising God, praising God while you're reading the Bible and in your prayer closet, to one day actually praising him in the presence of the Almighty God. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. Do that today because he is worthy of praise. And this is that only activity that we can do for eternity. It is the most natural thing to do. It is. Our heart truly wants to worship something. All of our bodies, see that's what really to me proves that God exists too because our bodies want to praise God. We want to praise something. Our, our bodies are built to praise something. Unfortunately, a lot of people in this world praise the wrong thing or give um, uh, worship to the wrong thing. You know, whether it be something in their life, someone in their life, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, a... Um, uh, an organization or a movement that they feel like I'm just going to give all my time, treasures, and talent into. Whatever it is, our bodies are made to worship. Our bodies are made to exalt something. Unfortunately, many people use it in the wrong way. There's a hole in our heart that needs to praise something or someone. And unfortunately, if they don't know Jesus, they will praise something. If we don't reach everyone for Jesus Christ, they will worship something. Everyone will worship something. 
It just depends on the direction they worship. And then in the direction they worship will also determine the direction they worship for eternity. And so right now I would pray and I would pray for your families and those in our community that their praises wouldn't be in vain, but we could reach them that their praises could go up to be an aroma for Jesus Christ. It is the most natural thing to do. We are born to worship. C.S. Lewis says this, and I think we all know who C.S. Lewis says. He needs no introductions. We praise what we enjoy. I could have just stopped there. I, that's right. Do you ever praise something you hate? Oh, man, I can't wait to get to that oil change. Hallelujah, praise God. No. We praise God. We spent a great time with our family. We praise God that we, we got to see our grandkids. We praise God that I got to see my father or mother. We, and it's usually always you praise God for people, you know. And so C.S. Lewis has it right. We praise God for what we enjoy. Because the praise not merely expresses, but it completes the enjoyment. I love that. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. I love that. Look at that at the end. Lover, it, it, the com, uh, uh, right here, it is not out of the compliments of your lover or out of those you love. Like, oh man, I just, I just love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I mean, that, words are cheap. That's what it's kind of saying there. Words are cheap. You're not going to get out of much out of just complimenting those you love by just telling them, oh, I like you. I love you. You're great. You're awesome. You know, but the thing is, is that it is, it is complete when it is expressed, when it's literally manifested, when your love is not talk anymore and it's action. We can say we just love God, but you have to express that. You have to enter into the King of Kings. You need to make it real in your life. You need to have it manifested in your life by the way you live, not just by the way you talk. I think it's a great, great uh, from there from C.S. Lewis. I don't think I have it on your notes. I should have put it on your notes that now that I think of it because I think it's just something that is so great because it's so easy for us to just say something. It's so easy for us to just say something. Oh yeah, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. But then we always forget. We always forget. It's not like we rebel and say, well, forget it. I'm not praying for that person. No, it's just we forget. But love is really expressed when you just say, and when you not say something, but you actually fulfill what you say. God's not into the lip service. God is into relationships, and he's into action. Obedience is better than sacrifice. and We obey the Lord in that. True fulfillment comes in worshiping God. Apart from that, we struggle with the frustrations and the emptiness of life. You can say how much you love God, but unless you enter into worship, you feel that emptiness. You feel that void, that there's something missing in your life by just saying it, but not truly entering in. Let us hunger more for worship every day. Let us hunger more for him every day and honor his role in our lives. I encourage you, if you're reading your word, which I hope you are and you're praying, I would start incorporating worship into that as well. Turn out whether you do it whether you do it because God put a word or a song in your heart and you just sing it a cappella, or you do what I do, and a lot of times when God puts a song in my heart, I go to YouTube, I go on my phone, I go to YouTube, I go to that song, and I might play it for five, six, seven times over and over again, just praising God. I feel you can just sense the, the, the praise is getting higher and higher and higher and higher, and that, and that negative thinking just goes lower, lower, and lower, or those thoughts that we have uh, uh, go lower and lower and lower, because as you're lifting God up, the flesh is going down. And so many times I'll read the word and I'll pray and I'm, and I'm just, you still feel like you're missing something until you start worshiping. And then it all comes together because when you're worshiping God, you're giving him the reverence uh, that he deserves. Second one, David, David acknowledges God's power as king of his life. He acknowledged God's power in, as the king of his life. Psalm 145, let's look now at three to six. So these are the scriptures here. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. 
they tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. I will exalt your great deeds. God is not inactive. God didn't create the world and say, good luck, you have fun, tell you the truth. How do you know when playtime is done? What did my parents do? When it was time to go in the house, my dad would go, you know, with the whistle, and he'd time to go in. God wasn't like, you go and you play, boys, you play, girls, and at the end, I will blow the trumpet to let you know to come home. He will do that, and I can't wait for him to do that. But he is also in our midst today. He is in your heart today. He is not inactive. As people think, he is the way maker. He, when he, you don't even feel it or see it sometimes, but he is working on your behalf. Paul says in Ephesians 3, how much is he working? Let me tell you. Now to him, him, Jesus, who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than anything you would even ask or imagine according to his power, which is limitless, that is a work within you. Mm. That could preach a whole message by itself. Now to him, Jesus. So think of what you need from Jesus today. Think of what your hurt is, your pain is, your desire, your dream is. Uh, Matter of fact, I remember one time, one of the first meetings, one of the first staff meetings I had with my first pastor that I served with way back in 1999. I started the ministry full time uh, with uh, with Pastor Pete Koshel at New Life in Oshkosh. And I remember one time in our staff meeting, he said, I want you to, I want you to uh, imagine what you want to see happen in your ministries. And so we were dreaming. It was like the dream team, and we were all thinking of great things we'd want to see in our ministries. And he said, you know what? God wants to do more of that. He wants to do more of what you're thinking. I mean, we were giving some, and he said, think big. He said, think audacious. Think big. Think huge. And so we kind of did. And then he said, all right, let me tell you what God wants to do. And he said, now to him who wants to take what you're thinking and give you immeasurably more in your family, measurably more in your life, immeasurably more in your work, immeasurably more in your school that you could even ask or that you could even imagine. Dream big because you can't dream big enough for what I want to do. You dream big. I love that. Another word for imagine is dream in some versions, say, or dreams. You know, we dream big according to his power, which is limitless. So if you're thinking big, God's power is, there is no limit to it. So he's going to, he wants to do more and work within us. If that is the case, then his works must be noticeable. What I'm saying there is he can't be inactive because if he wants to do immeasurably, more than we ask, then God is at work and it is noticeable. You will notice God working. It won't be like, oh my goodness, yes, he's doing great things. I just have faith that he's doing it. No, you will notice it. If he truly is going to do the immeasurable in your life, you will notice that change in your life. We are to meditate or think upon God's wonderful works. I want you to give that a thought. And you will be amazed how much God wants to work in your life. David says, his greatness, no one can fathom. I love that what David says. His greatness, no one can even think of. It's that great. I mean, try to think how great God is, and you can't, because it's even better than that. God is better than you think. God is better than anything you know. Any movie you saw, any Christian movie or Christian author that you read that talked about how good heaven is and how great our God is, that's nuts. That's nothing. That's our little tiny brain trying to comprehend an immeasurable God. Heaven is better than you've ever heard. Heaven is better than you've ever seen. It is incredible and it's awesome. And it's all for God's people. And his greatness has no, no limit. It's, it, there, it, no one can fathom how good our God is. We can't put it into words. We can't say it. That's why I love that we as, uh, as um, I, I don't even want to say Pentecostals because it's open to everyone. I don't want to say some of these God, but it's open to everyone. That's why I love speaking in tongues because my, my, my imagination can't pray good enough. My thoughts can't pray good enough. My limited, my limited vocabulary can only pray so much. But, but through speaking of tongues, the immeasurable can happen in reality because those are God's prayers and God's words that are coming through. And through speaking of tongues and being baptized in the Spirit. That's why I love to do that, because I feel I can, I, can, 
I can reach maybe a little, a little more uh, to God uh, through that. Again, this is only part of David's emphasis. Let us note what he says further in Psalm, in, in verses 4 and 6. He says, one generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. I will think about your wonderful works. I will lay everything for your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome, I love that, of your awesome works. And I will proclaim, I will tell others of how your great deeds are, of how good you are. Our God is so awesome. He is full of majesty and splendor. He has mighty acts that he wants to give to you and your family. Don't let the world or don't let the news and don't let the bad news limit your thoughts. And, and, and don't let too many of us, me included, let what other people say dictate of my power for God. We let what other people say dictate my God and dictate how I feel about my God and dictate what I should do. But my God is immeasurable. My God cares about me. My God has plans that are greater than even for me. And he supports me and he loves me. And our words have power because God's words have power to, to love and to bring people into a relationship with Jesus. It must be communicated. It must be told. It must be proclaimed. They must be passed on to the next generation. Because if we don't, then we're going to lose a generation. Our, our love for the Lord must be passed on to our kids, must be passed on to our grandkids, or must be passed up to our parents or another generation. That's why we need youth group. That's why we need young adults. That's why, we, that's why every single day when I pray around this church and I pray and, and I'm walking and I'm praying and I'm walking, well, now I'm doing more prayer walks around the church because it's a wonderful weather. But I always pray, God, I want us to grow by everyone. I mean, I, I'm not going to say no to anyone, but I specifically, God, I'm praying for young adults, young families, and young couples. Because that's that next generation that we need to give hope to. That's the generation that is seeing suicide at an all-time all high. We're seeing drug use at an all-time high. We're hearing more of gun shootings here in Fond du Lac more at an all-time high. People are depressed. People don't see a way out. Even, at, even though COVID is kind of, I don't think it'll be ever fully done, but all the, the shutdowns and that, they're still not feeling supported. They're still not feeling the hope. We're seeing it in the schools. We're seeing it in the workplaces. I mean, did you just notice yesterday, uh, a couple days ago, we had this mass shooting in Milwaukee uh, after, a, after a Bucks game. I think they're now. But then yesterday, 10 people died in Buffalo. All they wanted to do is they wanted to go to the grocery store and grab some groceries for their kids. And a mass shooting happened and 10 people died. People have no hope, and we're seeing these shootings more often. We're seeing these, uh, these th suicides happening more often. We're seeing disrespect happening more often because there is, there, there, they feel that there is no hope, and no one has told them about this hope. All they're hearing is from the news, which is horrible, which is death, which is war, which is rumors of wars, and they're, all their information is coming from death and doom and doom and death. Why do I even want to... Why would I even want to be on this earth if all I knew in my future was death and doom and dying? And oh, oh, by the way, not only that, but I'm going to die a poor man too because apparently there's no money. So that's all they're hearing. It's no money. You're going to be poor. You're going to, you know, good luck getting food. And all this is playing in their homes all the time. No wonder kids act out like that. No wonder adults like act out like that. No wonder we're, we're passing pills like there's no tomorrow because there is no hope that is given through Jesus Christ. That is the church's responsibility to be Jesus with skin on. We need to do that in the schools. Maybe it not, and maybe that means not even verbally saying Jesus, but through our love, through our actions, through the aroma of Christ, may that aroma be spread out into our schools and workplaces, into our jail system, wherever people are dying and needing the Lord. They have no hope except for the Lord Jesus, which they need to hear. So one generation... I, I, boy, I only got to three letters, words there. One generation commends your works to another. We must pass that on. They tell of your mighty deeds. 
They speak, they need hope that there is a God that cares, that he has mighty acts. They, uh, they want to know of a God that has glorious splendor. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of your power, of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. I remember when the news at least had some good news in it. Now the news, it's like, why even do I want to listen to the news anymore? Why do I even want to look on Facebook anymore? Because all it is is, oh, by the way, just so you know, another, by the fall, another huge, uh, you know, they're already predicting. And again, I'm not saying anything because I know it's killed a lot of people. But already there's news outlets saying that this fall could be the worst it's ever been. I mean, can we just stop? My goodness. It's not even the, can we enjoy summer? But they're already are talking about the fall being the worst yet for COVID. It's just like, mm, I, you know, I, I just got to watch my language there for a second because it just makes me so, it just makes me so upset. It's like, can't we just enjoy now? What, what, what is your purpose of always saying, oh, poor is me. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It's just like Satan is just working full time. If he can destroy, if he can steal Kill and destroy. Steal the love. Kill the joy. You know, it's just like, if he can do that, he can get all of us. We need to stand up. If that means turn off the news, turn it off. If that means stop your podcast, whatever. We need to be above and to just give joy-filled joy love to a place that has none. And so I hope you're understanding that. I wasn't in my notes at all. It's just that we need to pass on love and joy and hope to a generation that's not getting it in the schools and not getting it in the news as a whole. And we need to do that. You know what? Maybe it's time that we are the only people with Jesus with skin on. Um, and it's not going to be given through the TV. It's got to be given through God's people. It must be communicated. It must be passed on. Let the next generation see how attractive our God is. Not how attractive our God is. How? Through us. Through you. You've got to believe it. You've got to own it. A person who truly believes this refuses to doubt God. Until you own it, you will be a fearful prayer person. If you believe in a substandard God, the next generation will catch on and even think less of the God, less of God. If you believe in a substandard God, then the next generation will catch on from you and the next generation will catch on from you until finally the gospel is so watered down that Satan's got it. We can't let the gospel water down. We can't. We're going to do it in love, but we cannot water down the gospel. And so we must believe and show of a God that is in the word. Because the next generation is going to catch from you. If you love God, but you don't worship God, then the next generation will not only not know God, but they won't worship God. We need to worship him. We need to worship him in spirit and truth. Young people and, and teenagers and young adults, they watch you the way you worship. Actually, it doesn't even have to be young people. Anyone watches each other. We all watch each other when we worship God. And the way you worship God is what they're going to think in their minds is how to worship God. So I encourage you, just worship God with everything that's within your heart. Use your voice. Sing it out to God. Raise a holy hand up to God and say, you are my God. You are my king. I want this generation to see people who are in love with God, not just with their words. This generation doesn't want your words. They get your words and it's always bad. They don't want to hear you talk. They want to see you act out. They want to see you worship God. They want to see you read the word. They want to see you pray. They want to see you worship God. They don't want to get the excitement at a Brewers game. They don't want to get the excitement at a Packers game where they're excited, but then they're swearing and spilling beer all over. They want to see the acknowledgement and the joy of God in a house of God. And they want to know there's a future and one not to fear and one not just to go through or one just to, to check a mark, but one to be joyful of, one to go all the way to heaven in joyful exclamation. That is, the, that is the, the, the God that I want to express. That is the God that I want others to see. I want to be that Jesus with skin on that others want to be. I want to make people thirsty for Jesus. I want to make people hungry for Jesus. And that only happens not by what you say, but by what you do and how you act. All right, next one. David acknowledges God's character as king in life. 
Psalm 145, 7 through 9, they celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. I always stop there because I'm like, praise God. There are so many stupid things that we do in our lives where God could just get angry right away. But he's slow to anger even in our foolishness. But he's rich in love. He's slow to anger, but he's full of love. He is rich in it because he's love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made, except that. You can almost sense that David is running out of words to say. He's almost running out of the words to describe his king. Let's look at some of these words. He said abundant, goodness, righteousness, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love, good to all, has compassion. It's almost like he's just going for words here, but he doesn't know because his God is so great, he kind of runs out of words there. He says they will celebrate and joyfully sing. He will show the love of his God. He will show how much he is. And sometimes here's the thing too. We don't feel like worshiping God. We're tired. We're sick. We've had a long week. You know, it's been a struggle all week and I just want to relax. Those are the times you got to lift up your hands even faster because God literally lives inside the praises of his people. You need a touch from God. The Bible makes it clear. He lives inside the praises of his people. And so you worship God. Even when you're sick, you praise him more. Even when you're tired, you praise him more. Even when you're depressed, praise him more. You're full of anxiety, praise him more because he wants to live inside your heart how is he going to help you he's got to get in the heart and so how does that you praise God and he literally lives inside the praises of his people so if you're tired today you're worn out today whatever the case may be you're sick and tired of the news you're sick and tired of being sick and tired you give praise to God and let the let God arise and his enemies be scattered let God arise in your life and in your heart praise God We thank you for that. Again, he says he will celebrate and joyfully sing because of who he is. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can I get an amen? Amen, amen. David, next one. David acknowledges God's uh, uh, superiority as king in life. As king in life. Psalm 145, 10 through 13 says this. All your works praise you, God. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of your glory, of your kingdom, and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. That's the security we have in God. God has no rivals. Not even the devil. And some of us think that, the, well, you know, who, who's the rival to, to God? It's the devil. No, 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 no. I mean, God, all he have to do is go bing, and he'd be gone. He'd be gone. He'd be dead. Matter of fact, he wouldn't even have to go ding. He would just have to say, you know, I mean, I mean, the power of God is so great. You know, there is this war in the heavenlies right now. But if God wanted to, he would just say, and it would be whoop, done. But all these need to be all these things need to be worked out in fulfillment of the scriptures. That's the thing, too, is like, man, God, why don't you do this, this, and that? But yet God's word doesn't say that that's going to happen. God, this is God's word, and he will fulfill that. He can do whatever he wants, but he will fulfill his word. And so there is no rival to God. Satan is just a little puny, little tiny, little, tiny little whatever. I mean, it's not even close. I mean, if they both were, if they both were going head to head, I would put... I, you know, I, I don't gamble. I was going to say all my money, but all my prayers. How about that? I'd put all my prayers over on the side of God because I know he's got it. I know he's got it. Matter of fact, he could just take care of Satan and the whole world at the same time. That's how great my God is. For God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. If this is not certain, then we have every reason to be afraid today, church. Nothing is guaranteed for us. We all know that. But his kingdom is guaranteed and his kingdom is everlasting. Therefore, our security is eternal. Next one. David's acknowledges God's provision as the king in his life. Let's look at verse 13b and 16. The Lord is trustworthy in all the promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every 
living thing. Having said so much about God's greatness, majesty, and kingship, it almost comes across as if he's distant or detached. But David makes a sudden change in perspective and tells us that God cares even for the very basic needs of his people. This mighty God cares about the one who has fallen and the one who has no food. He is your provider. Such concern seems small and insignificant in the light of what has been said before, but the fact is, that is our God. If it's a big deal to you, it's a big deal to God. I don't care how small your need is, give it to the Lord. Too many of you think the small things are your problems, the big things are God's. It's a lie from that. That's a lie from the pit. God wants to hear everything, all of it. He wants it all. He's a jealous God. If you don't tell him it, he's going to ask you to tell him anyway because he's jealous. God, I'm going to tell you this, but I'm not going to tell you at all. No, he's jealous. He wants to hear everything. He's your God. He died for you. He deserves it all. Matter of fact, you're not even your own anyway. You better tell him because he owns you anyway if you're a Christian. He opens his hand to satisfy you. I want to be satisfied today. I really do. So open up. he wants to open his hands to that, and he is willing to help you. David acknowledges... David acknowledges God's presence in your life. And that's, I want that so bad in my life. Amen? We all do. Psalm 145 says this, a couple more verses. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. Not just call on him, but call on him knowing who he is that he's your king. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him, and he hears the cries and saves them. While God is the Lord of the universe, he is also very near and in your heart. God is near to all who call on him. He is always there. Here's the thing. He is always there, but we have not always been there. He is always there, but we oh, but sometimes we don't always feel his presence, but he is there. Those who draw close to him feel him, know him. It is good that God gives us things, but what is more important is that God gives us him, period. I love the, I love the, the spoiling part of it, but I just want him. I want the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His presence in my life is everything. I mean, he can give us whatever he wants, and that's great for the blessings. But without him, it's all for nothing. You want to experience the king's presence? Ah, here it is. Write it down. It's the biggest thing you'll ever hear. It's pray. Pray. And he is there. Not that he is distant, but if we pray, he's there and he's in our hearts. How much more special it is for us to be in his presence. Pray, and that will be his honor. Psalm 145, 18 says, the Lord is near. I want you, God, so close to me. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Last thing that I have for you today. And then I want to end with an illustration. David acknowledges God's protection as king of kings. I need God's protection. Our world needs God's protection. God's people need his protection. Ukraine needs his protection. Psalm 145, 20 and 21 says, The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked will be destroyed. Praise God. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever and ever and ever. As his children, God gives us this guarantee or assurance that we are protected by him. You can have the confidence that God is watching over you today and all the way until we see him face to face. Nothing in this universe matters to him as much as what is going on in your life today. I hope you believe this. He is the king of kings of this universe, but also the father that is so close to you today, he wants to wrap his arms around you. We are the only creation in all of God's massive creation that is made in his likeness. Do you know that? Do you know that? That we are, that we are the only creation in God's massive creation that was made in his likeness. I think there's something special about that. We have his mark. You don't have to bother him to get his attention. You got it already. You died, he died for that attention. You better give it to him. You don't have to beg him to listen to you or, or try to convince him that you mean business. No, 
In fact, it is the other way around. We are the ones that a lot of times need convincing that God is there. We need to be convinced that God is listening to us and that he is willing to help. How do we change that? We have to be connected to the source. Connect with God and acknowledge his role in your life. That he is truly our King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Before we go to prayer today, is the video still unmuted back there? Thanks. Um, what I want to show right now is I want to show a uh, video, and as the video starts, I'll turn these lights off so it's a little easier to see. Um, but I want you to, um, I'm a big fan, and I know Elliot is a big fan of Louis Giggly. And I love his word pictures, and I love his illustrations, and I love how he d uh, did our C group and had this table, you know, amongst the enemies. And every week he would talk about this table and use illustrations. And in every one of his messages, he uses illustrations to just lighten up our world, to make it a little more easier to understand. And so he shared something about um, who God is. That not only is he the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but he's also our star maker. And I think this just greatly illustrates of the king of kings in our life today. And so, so Zach, why don't you start then? I want you to watch this with an open heart before we pray. Our God is incredible. Our God has created all of this to show who he is, who he is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Matter of fact, I even want to update you a little bit more on what you just saw is that that actually isn't the biggest star since then. That was made uh, a few years ago, I think in the 90s. And um, let me just give you a little bit of an update. The circumference of the stars. The sun is 2.7 million miles in its circumference. The biggest observable star now is the UY Scotty. And it is 1,000, remember, this is just observable. There's even probably bigger ones that are in the heavens that we can't even see yet. It is 1,708 times larger than the sun. So the circumference, if you would want to drive around this star, would be 4,634,497,400 and 48 miles. With all heads down and all eyes closed. God is in this room. Elliot and Helen, if you can go on one side. Carol, if you could go on the other. I'll just use two today. Our God is a great, incredible, awesome, huge God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. But he cares about you. And we see here that, da that David acknowledges his king in his rightful place, in his power, in his character, in his superiority, in his provision, in his presence, in his protection as king in his life. And my question to you is, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about today? Or how about this? You saw how great the universe is. You saw how big the universe is. You see how big the stars are. And again, that is only in the observable stars. So my question to you is, how big is your problem compared to that? how big that is? Nothing. You think you have a big problem? Our God is bigger. Our God is infinitely bigger. Look at, when you think about it, when you think about it, it doesn't take you long on an airplane. It just, let's just make it very, very, very easy for us to understand. You're in an airplane. And you're seeing everyone as they should at the airport. You know, so there's going to be some taller. There's going to be some shorter. But we're, you know what? We're pretty much all the same. You start getting on the plane. You start climbing up. People are starting to look a little smaller. Cars are starting to look like matchbox cars. Buildings are starting to look like little things you would play as a kid. Then you get up to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. Then you, go, you get to a point where you can kind of barely make out buildings and roads. And then you get to a height where you just 
you know, before you, once you hit over the clouds and you can't see anything, but before you hit those clouds, all you really see is fields. That, that's all you can because your eyes can't focus. You don't see anything. You literally are above your problems. And that's just earth. And our king is so incredibly awesome that not only is he above all, Matter of fact, when you think of it, he is so above all. I mean, just think of what he probably could see. Probably nothing. But he is such a great, incredible God that not only is he high above the heavens, but he's also right here close to your heart, if not in your heart. And so today, whatever you're going through, whatever pain you're going through, whatever struggle you're going through, I want you to acknowledge the King of King and the Lord of Lords in your life. Give him your struggles, give him your pains, give him your hurts. He wants it. He died for it. Matter of fact, God, did, the word says that, that God has a, uh, that God wants to give you peace that transcends all understanding. Here's the key of that. It's the peace of God. It's not peace from God. There's two huge differences. It's the peace of God, not a peace from God. It's not like, hey, I have peace, and I'm going to give it to you if you beg for it. No, it's his own peace. It's him. God's not saying, I'm going to give you a part. God's not saying, I'm going to give you peace from me. No, he's saying, I'm giving you peace. I'm giving you me. Isn't that incredible? I mean, it's not like, okay, I'm giving you the car keys, have fun. That's awesome enough. But he's not giving us the car keys. He's giving us him everything. Thank you, Jesus. And so right now what we're going to do is I'm just going to pray as we do every single week here. I'm going to pray a prayer. And after that, we're going to go into the one last worship song. As soon as that song is done, if you, got, if you have to leave, go. That's awesome. But during this song, I'd like all of us to stay in here, worship God. If you need to come to the altars and just acknowledge how big your king is, that's what the altar is for. If you need anything you need prayer for, anything in your life or in your kid's life, at your job or at school, workplace, wherever, we have elders that are here that want to pray for you. And we don't want to leave here until God is done with you. And so this place is open for you. Don't hurry. Don't rush. God's here. God wants to speak love and hope into your future and into your life now. He wants you to be. See, here's the thing. He wants to prepare you to be a blessing to those that are hurting in our world right now. Where all they're hearing is wars and death. God wants to prepare you for out there. In your families and workplaces, at your schools, wherever. So let's prepare. Let this be the place of the training that God has for us today. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I love this church and its people. Lord God, bless our people today. Bless those that I know are, are, are uh, Lord, not with us today. They're, they're somewhere else, but bless us that are here. And Lord God, minister to us. I know that, Lord, where two or three are gathered, you're here. And Lord God, you are speaking to someone in this place. Speak love, speak hope, for you are the king and you are almighty of over everything. Be the way maker in our lives. In your holy name. Amen. Let's worship.